Welcome to episode 32 of the Road to Unicum. This is Togram, and today we're going to look at Unicum platooning tactics and I'm going to share with you examples of my four favorite ones. The first is creating two versus one isolations because if you get on the sides of tanks you can force them to expose their side hull or side turret armor and what's great is you can force early two versus ones if you're in tanks that have pretty good mobility. So Jory in his T-57 and me in the E-5 have pushed up pretty aggressively in this windstorm battle and we found an isolated E-100. Now this is one of the strongest tanks on the other team but even though he has strong alpha he's got a really long reload time so once he fires we know we've got a pretty large window to apply damage in return and obviously you know in a two versus one situation we can sit here and just basically out dbm him and it's so funny too this like e100 is really mad he's raging and claiming that jory is firing gold which he's not the e100 was simply pushing up straight toward us and giving us his lower plate over and over again now there is another two versus one opportunity looking at the map you can see just to the north of me is an e4 and that E4 is actually pushed up too close to the end of the intersection. So my other platoon mate, Jeffrey, in an STB, is right on the other side of him, and I punch this E4 through his front drive wheel. So now he's tracked, and he's in a really terrible spot, because one, he only has, he has a very long reload, so he can only fire at one of us. And moreover, Jeffrey and I can keep bouncing back and forth, because he can only look at one of us at a time. We're tracking him on each of the drive wheels on our side and hold him in place until we can finish him off. Two versus ones are really great in late game situations and you want to be careful to try to spread out on opposite sides of your opponent. So here Jory has got this T28 Prot spotted and he puts him down into one shot territory so I'm able to rush up easily and the T28 Prot's not even looking in my direction and that's our seventh platoon kill for this particular Sacred Valley map. It's a pretty hard carry. Another tactic is to look at pinching your foes and this is you know, simply creating two sets of angles where you are coming at your opponents and in some cases you don't even have to be that far you don't have to drive by your opponents you just need to get up so you're a little bit perpendicular to them so our platoon and a lot of our friendly tanks are pushing down the zero line and what I've done is come down the nine line and push up the side of this hill so I'm looking down and at the side hulls and side turrets of these other heavy tanks and these heavy tanks in front of us are in a really bad spot. They really should back up because as long as they stay where they are, they can only defend against one field of fire. They're either going to be giving me really easy side hull and turret shots, or if they turn their turret to face me, they're going to be exposing the side of their heads to the my friendly tanks that are on the zero line. And you know, through this whole sequence, we end up building a massive HP lead. You can tell like a lot of their tanks are already hurting. And you know, in a situation like this, it's hard to blow a lead like this when you have such really good map control. I tag that IS-4 through his drive wheel, he's tracked, and I know he's not going to be able to turn his hull or do anything to defend himself before my reload is finished. Now once we kill some of these tanks, we've lost our pincher. I was the guy applying the side pressure, now I can't do it because there's this big uh, hill in front of us, and if you look at the minimap, they've got tank destroyers sitting over on G5, so I need to be careful, so I want to reapply the pinch but in order to do that I need to move up close to that rock that's a little bit off to the right of me to keep that between me and those tank destroyers that are providing overwatch coverage and we'll talk about overwatch in a couple minutes that's another really really key tactic to consider and a lot of these tanks are pretty beat up so you know this is like really easy kill shots over and over again uh, we did lose a couple tanks as they drove around the south side of this hill and put themselves into They've, we basically lost the pincer and they're just fighting you know, each other front on and then those CDs in the back were hitting some of our tanks. But you know, once I take out this E75, that's pretty much it. This whole side of the map is done. The only guys they have now are those TDs that are sitting up on the hill and we're able to put some hurt onto this JPE-100 before he's able to pull back. And he probably should have pulled back earlier because you know, as he's as he pulling back over the lip of the hill, he's showing us his underbelly. Here's another example of pinching your foes. And in this case, we're able to push up aggressively because the enemy doesn't have control of the hill and abbey and so I'm able to push up to where this rock is right in front of me and that's a nasty situation for the opposing 5120 because he doesn't have any meaningful turret armor whereas I do and so if we're gonna snapshot each other you know it's not gonna be an even exchange he's likely to get penetrated whereas I am not and the good thing about being here is you know we're both denying their tanks ability to push up in this lane so they can't push down 
the one line because we'll spot them. And like some of their enemy tanks like this, tank just pushed out into the open here, this 257, he's in a kill zone now. What's eventually going to happen is our friendly players, the puppies, are going to see the opportunity to push down the one line. And once they do that, then the tanks that are in front of us, such as the 5120, and a 59 Patton are totally screwed because they're going to be they're going to have enemies on two sides and they can't get out, they can't exit safely. As a matter of fact, that 140 drives himself in a moment into our pincher. He drives himself right in the middle of it. He really should have stayed back or flexed somewhere else. So we're being patient here, and the nice thing is there's only one direction of fire that can come at us while we're sitting here. So we're just farming these guys for damage, building up a huge HP lead. And during the T-57 or exchanging shots, I a little belatedly come out here in the front to try to provide some cover for Jory, kind of picking up the kill. Uh, but, you know, it's it's one thing also, it's important within a platoon to be willing to share hit points, especially since he's the autoloader, and if one of us needs to die or take damage, it's probably me that should do it, because anytime an autoloader is going to be out in the open, uh, they're going to be exposing themselves to fire. So you can see we really quickly mow down the 59 Patton, that Object 140, and then unfortunately for this E5, all of his friends are dead because he wasn't able to apply enough damage on us given his location. And, you know, his other allied drivers were in terrible positions where he couldn't really save them. Another tactic is to set over-unders, and this is building on the classic military tactic of Overwatch, where one tank is on elevated ground or is able to provide cover for tanks that are below them. In this case, our under tank is Jeffrey in a medium tank, and then Jory's going to join him in his bat chat. I'm providing the overwatch in the back and sniping, and what's great is we have an asymmetrical vision advantage. Our friendlies that are providing the under coverage can spot these tanks, whereas they can't spot me because they lack the vision. And this IS-8, once he pulls out, I hit him through the front drive wheel, and I'm now punching him through shot after shot in his near side pike nose, which is flat when he's stuck at an angle like that. Now, we do have too much redundancy in here in terms of Overwatch. You can see there are three other friendly tanks, so I don't necessarily need to sit here and say I'm going to go ahead and flex and help wipe out tanks somewhere else. Now, the important thing about using this tactic, if you're going to be the tanks in the under position, if only one of you goes, you're at risk of just having the enemy tanks rush, rush over the hill and come and take you out. Now, in this case, we had both Jeffrey and Jory together, and, you know, those guys, one of them has good DPM, and the other one is an autoloader, so that's pretty intimidating for an you know, opposing team to push down on. Here's another example of over-under. In this case, I'm the under in my E5, and what I've done is pushed up far enough that I can spot their approach towards the hill. And what this does is it'll give our tanks in the middle of the map around F5, F6 shots on their tanks as they get up on hill. And pretty soon people get wise to what I'm doing. Our puppies actually... Uh, position themselves in the right way. So you can see there's a cluster of TDs down by J7, and we also have tanks that are pushing up the hill along the zero line. So we're in a good position, and I'm not so worried about their tanks. If their tanks push over the top of hill to shoot down on me, they're just gonna get wrecked. And if their tanks try to push across the, the flat ground on me, well, I I'm an E5 and I've got a pretty good armor profile, so I can back up, and the TDs behind me can provide some cover fire. Now, for whatever inexplicable reason, you know, a 704 totally YOLOs in here and puts himself in between multiple enemy tanks and gets wrecked. But, you know, the deceiving thing is even though we're behind on the scoreboard by a tank, we have so damaged many of their tanks that it's going to be really easy for us to finish off this flank and to, you know, gain map control. And the, really the only thing I've been very concerned about watching as per normal is for RD fire, especially since I don't have the benefit of XVM camo all show up as a purple player and you know, it does seem to me, in my objective opinion, that if you're purple, you're much more likely to get clicked. So this last tank here, that's an easy side shot. We've now broken over, open the entire eastern side of the map in Prokhorovka, and we end up smashing the enemy from there. Here's another example of over-under. I'm the under in my E50, and the overwatch is provided by Jory in the T54 Lightweight. Kind of an odd scenario, because usually it's the other way around, but Jory's in a really good sniping position, and he can't be spotted because he's sitting behind a bush, and the heavy tanks that are along the zero line can't see him because he's on the other side of a hill and behind a rock. So while I can't fire on the enemy tanks until they come over or around the hill, if you look at this from Jory's perspective, this is like shooting fish in a barrel. I mean, this is like your ideal dream is just sit here and be able to fire at the exposed sides just with you know regular silver ammo. 
and you know farm a lot of damage and help us build up an HP lead. It turns out later we really need this because a lot of our puppies died and Joriat and I end up completing a pretty late carry through this match. Eventually Jory's got to exit here because you know he, he knew those uh, heavy tanks were coming he was going to get spotted. The last tactic, and this is hilarious, Jory and I have done this in so many situations where you know, the opponents don't necessarily know what your situation is as far as ammo and reloading. And in this particular case, you know, Jory, since he's got such high hit points, he's just going to drive around that E5 to get him to turn his turret for an easy side headshot kill for me. And then their T-34 is rushing up, so Jory goes ahead and flexes around to the side, and I get some pretty bad RNG there. Like, I miss a snapshot on the full exposed side of a T-34, and he, with his poor bad gun handling, actually snapshotted me. But at least, you know, Jory got the kill shot there. The only issue is that I'm one-shottable, and Jory's telling me on TeamSpeak that the ST-1 is looking at him. The thing the ST-1 doesn't know is that Jory just fired his last round, and it's going to take me two shots to kill the ST-1. If I die, we're guaranteed to lose because Jory can't do any damage to him. So what Jory does is totally gets the ST-1's attention. The ST-1 fires at him. Jory's not one-shottable, so now I'm able to get an easy shot on the ST-1. If you read the chat that's going on, it's absolutely hilarious. And then Jory ends up driving around the ST-1, who's still fixated on him, and then you know this gives me an easy kill shot. Now, if we look at this from Jory's perspective, again, you know, he knows based on the alpha of the ST1 and his current hit point situation, he can afford to do this. And, you know, you could argue he probably should have driven over to the side of the ST1 as soon as possible. But the bottom line is when he's got his attention like this, this is pretty much game over and, you know, an easy kill shot for me you know, that I could make, you know, half drunk and with, you know, one eye closed. So those are four of my favorite platooning tactics. I'm sure that I've missed some of your favorite ones, so please share them in the comments below and let me know what you think about the video. Hope you enjoyed it. Take care.